Welcome back to the Telecom TV 5G Evolution Summit and our live Q&A show. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the final live Q&A show for this year's summit. So your last chance to quiz our panelists and guests. Now, we've just seen the panel discussion that looked at the 5G evolution towards 6G, and now we're going to expand on that, answer whatever questions you have, and dig a little deeper into the whole 5G evolution topic, including, of course, fixed wireless access. Now, if you haven't yet sent in a question, please do so now using the Q&A form right here on the website. This is your final chance to do so. And joining me for this live Q&A show is, as always, Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director here at Telecom TV. Ray, you know, on the one hand, operators are a little reluctant to talk too much about 6G, given the huge investment that they've got with 5G. However, so many companies are already manoeuvring to make sure they capitalise on this 6G opportunity when it eventually arrives. It all makes for a fascinating situation. Yeah, uh, for sure. And, and what's really interesting, Guy, is how many current major developments that are part of the whole 5G evolution process are set to play a key role in what is currently being envisaged as and called 6G, uh, getting the distributed cloud foundations and dense fiber and small cell deployments right in the next five years or so is going to be critical for what happens next as we head towards 6G. And of course, it's not only the operators looking at this, 6G is also going to reshape the developer and vendor sectors. And of course, politicians see this as a land grab too. Uh, being seen as the leader in 6G appears to be important to the tub thumpers that very likely struggle to hold their iPhones up the right way. <laughs> well, politicians need all the distractions they can get at the moment, certainly here in the UK. But as you rightly say, there are a lot of moving parts at play here and potentially a very lucrative reward for them in the long term. So let's now meet our guests who have returned to help answer all your questions. And joining us live on the programme today are Narotham Saxena, who is Vice President, Technology, Strategy and Architecture at US Cellular. Joe Barrett, President of the Global Mobile Suppliers Association, the GSA. And David Boswathic, Director of New Technologies for Etsy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks so much for joining us again. Now, Ray, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Have you got the first one for us? Guy, yes, I do. Uh, and the question is, uh, do we have any use cases yet for 5G advanced or are we too focused on technology? Because we're still trying to figure out the killer apps for basic 5G. And it's incredible how much this uh, 5G killer app uh, question still crops up. So, uh, uh, Narotham, um, you know, do we still need to figure out a lot uh, to do with the 5G we've, we've got already without thinking at this point about 5G advanced? So, uh, my view is like 5G uh, has, a built, has given us a strong foundational element and uh, it enables quite a few things. But 5G Advance brings some more enhancements, which are extremely important uh, as we think about coverage, because there are uplink enhancements that are going to happen there, uh, better energy efficiency gains, uh, and also the use of AI and ML uh, for further optimization to improve the customer experience as well as improve the network performance. So I, I do believe 5G Advance does bring an incremental and additional value, and it brings a solid foundation of uh, uh, to go to the next level, next generation of technologies over time. But So that's my view. And I also one specific example is fixed wireless access, for example. Fixed wireless access, uh, is is one of the most talked about use cases with 5G today, and it helps bridge the digital divide. I think 5G enables uh, a good experience for fixed wireless access uh, the, with, with the capabilities it brings, like massive MIMO uh, is, for example, for the mid-band, it provides good capacity and, and, and the higher band spectrums gives very good speeds. So I think with all the three layers of the spectrum, low, mid, and high band, 
with 5G technologies such as massive MIMO uh, and better beam forming and which giving giving us better spectral efficiency, I think it will enable fixed wireless access and make it a very compelling use case, especially in rural America or rural countries uh, to bridge the digital divide. Okay, uh, thanks, Narosa. Um I, I imagine there's probably a few people out there who are, who are thinking, uh, you know, if if fixed wireless access is is the, the the best use case that we can talk about for five G at the moment, then things maybe haven't uh, developed uh, quite a, as well as as people might have uh, hoped for. Uh, but I, I know we've got some questions about FWA coming up uh, as well that have already come in for the audience, so we'll come back to that topic quite shortly. Um, okay, if there's no more comments about five uh, G advanced, Guy, I'll hand over to you for. For the next audience question. Yep, thank you very much, Ray. We, we are getting a, a lot in around the topic of 5G uh, advanced, um, and we also had quite a few in on, on fixed wireless access. And this next question is a, a fixed wireless access question. Um, why is FWA suddenly being deployed by so many operators? What is 5G offering that is making this a viable option? Now, Joe, you spoke to us earlier on the show about FWA. So why don't you start us off some thoughts? You know, what, what is it about 5G that's, that's suddenly making or seems to be making FWA um, so much more of a, a popular choice for operators? Thanks, Guy. Uh, yeah, I think the, um, the change is partly around spectrum um, and then also, you know, the, re the requirement to really bridge the digital divide, as, as we've said. I mean, we've seen a lot of C-band spectrum uh, being auctioned and made available and assigned uh, over the past few years. Um, and if we look at the number of uh, fixed wireless access operators, uh, so we have 141 5G operators that we're tracking um, in our database. And so that shows that operators are really seeing 5G as a, a viable solution for fixed wireless access. Uh, I haven't yet seen a, a good breakdown of the, of the spectrum that's being used. It's one of the projects we've got for next year to, to really identify the spectrum that's being used for fixed wireless access. But if you look at where uh, C-band has been assigned, especially in Europe, so 20% of the 5G deployments are in Europe uh, for, for fixed wireless access. So I think it's, it's clear to say that spectrum is being clear, playing a clear role in uh, in bringing fixed wireless access uh, more into focus with operators. Great, thanks very much, Joe. Um, yeah, we, we'll certainly be uh, watching that research with interest. Uh, you know, the use of, of Spectrum on FWS. That uh, sounds fascinating. We'd like to see what that brings up. Um, okay, thanks very much for that. Hopefully, that's answered our viewers' question there. So, um, I, I think therefore we should uh, move on, Ray, um, and hand back over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Guy. Uh, the next question we have from our audience is, will there be much difference between 5G advanced and 6G? Um, so nice, short and sweet uh, question there. Uh, David, maybe you could uh, kick off with this one. Thank you, Ray. Excellent question, because uh, we're still developing 5G, 5G advanced, uh, and we've only just started thinking about 6G. Um, the, the roadmap between 5G advanced and, and 6G is over four or five years. And the research which is happening now is showing some new technologies. If you look at the functionality, they're quite similar. Um, energy efficiency, um, uh, virtual private networks, slicing, AI, native AI, um, massive MIMO, distributed massive MIMO. So you've got this whole host of technologies which are being researched. The difference, uh, it's, it's a killer question or the key question, what will define 6G apart from the, the number on the, on the, on the network indicator? Um, I think the focus will be more about, less, less about technology. Obviously researchers, they only talk about technology, but less about technology, more about uh, business case, business use case and, and application. Um, reaching out to different industries, focusing more on sustainability and energy efficiency. In 5G Advance, we already start. I think in 6G, all of the operators are saying, uh, number one priority, sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. So I think we're gonna have to stop at some point 
just throwing technology at the network, which is terrible coming from a standards organization which deals in technology, and actually look at the, the use cases or the orientation of 6G. What will it serve? How will it be different to 5G? I think 5G is a fantastic technology family, and it is still advancing. There's already energy efficiency inside. There's already the ability to have virtual private networks or network slices for ind individual industries. I think there's a lot to be done in 5G and 5G advanced already. Where we are today in 6G is fundamental research, early technology studies, and feasibility to see where 6G could be in 2030, 2031. Um, it's very competitive. We've seen, I probably said this in the panel, but we've seen people talking about 6G far earlier than they did 10, 12 years ago about 5G. So there's a lot of pressure, possibly due to geopolitics, but every region wants to say we are a leader in 6G. Good to take a step back and say, okay, what, what will 6G be? Will it be about faster, better, wider, great reach, um, space uh, communications, or will it just be about doing a better network that can sue, uh, so, serve humanity whilst not killing the planet uh, and using lots of energy? So I think it's really early to say the difference between 5G and 6G. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Yeah, and, and absolutely, there seems to be a massive determination for every region in the world to be seen as the, uh, as the leader, as being the, the, at the forefront of, of 6G. Uh, research. Um, uh, Joe, how do you see this playing out? You know, 5G Advanced has a, a, a lot of capabilities. Will, there, will it be a seamless transition to 6G or will it be another sort of, you know, big, big bang change? I think we'll see a, um, a general evolution. Um, I mean, people do talk about some revolution. It'll depend on the technology choices. Uh, but the reason we're talking about uh, 6G now is that we've got WRC23. Um, next year, so the World Radio Telecommunications Conference, and so we need to get, as I said um, uh, earlier, you know, agenda items into uh, this being discussed and agreed at WRC 23, so that those agenda items can be researched. Look at the different spectrum that's going to be required um, for uh, for 6G, and then get that decision made in WRC 27. So there's a lot of work. Um, that is being done, and especially support from within GSA, within our um, uh, our Spectrum group. So that is a lot of work that these guys are putting in, and and I suppose that's one of the reasons why we're talking about it now, um, because there's a lot of work going on today in preparation for next year. Right. Yes. Of course. Yeah. That's a that's a very big deal coming up there. A very good point there, Joe. Um, uh, and Rotham, you wanted to come in. Uh, here as well. Um, 5G advanced to, to 6G, uh, big leap or natural step? Yeah, so I, I think um, David and uh, Jose covered it very well, but uh, I would say it's incremental. 6G is built on the foundation elements of 5G. Uh, as David said, I mean, 6G is still evolving and in early stages of discussion. But as we embark on that journey, uh, I think it, there are a few things that we should keep in mind. One is how can we make the technology more efficient and how do we uh, improve the total cost of ownership? How do we address the operational necessities? Because most of the time that is the part that is ignored uh, as we focus on new Gs. So I think that's an opportunity for the industry to focus on uh, how can we address those operational necessities, better automation, driving cost per bit down, driving the TCO down, uh, because, uh, and that's important. And the other aspect is 5G advanced and 5G is giving you capabilities like AI, ML, uh, distributed MIMO. Now you can, we can take that and expand further on that as mm -hmm. networks get more ultra dense and cell less networks evolve. I, I think you can build the capabilities on top of 5G advanced to cater to the needs of what the usage would be and what the applications would look like in 2030 and beyond. Great, thanks, Narotham. Uh, I'm just going to take over from uh, from Ray a second because we're just going to um, we've got a little slight uh, audio gremlin in the microphone. So uh, I'm just, I'm just going to take over because I want to pick up on this 6G 
thread because whilst the three of you have been speaking, we've got a couple more questions come in on the on the 6G area. Um, so here's one. Um, will 6G research and development be dominated by the hyperscalers? That's an interesting take. Uh, what can today's telecoms vendors contribute to 6G R&D? Um, well, David, uh, I, I know you're, you're very passionate about bringing research and, and uh, getting it de the development through into the standards and eventually commercialization phase. Uh, any, any thoughts on this? Uh, because this, uh, this view obviously thinks that uh, it's the hyperscalers that will be doing most of the R&D here. Um, yeah, I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will be doing a lot of R&D, but possibly it won't be called 6G. Um, most of the 6G research that I'm working with, so that's the European research under the SNSJU, uh, research in the UK under 5G UK and 5G, in, 5G innovation, research in France, research in Germany, it's mainly the big operators, European, UK and other, uh, and uh, the vendors, and then obviously the, the main universities in the UK, in Europe and, and, and beyond. So we're not seeing too much of the hyperscalers working on the European projects for 6G, but I'm sure they are working. I mean, they're, they're continually innovating and they're continually bringing up fantastic new things. I'm not sure how they will be involved with others in the consortia working on 60 research projects. The SNSJU have just approved 35 um, new research projects, which will be starting in January. And these are all be studying innovative technologies, evolution technologies for 5G advanced and groundbreaking technologies for 6G. Um, and that is mainly uh, organizations based in Europe and, and around Europe. So I think we'll see two different tracks. Uh, the official 6G research, which is, comes under ATIS, comes under the European Commission, um, Japan, China and others. And then we'll see, as always, this fantastic innovation which happens in the, in the hyperscalers and often leaves us a little bit, you know, broadsided. So, yes, there's a lot of innovation. The challenge is to make sure that it gets to market. So we can have lots of fantastic research happening in parallel, sometimes in duplication, but the optimization of that, so bringing it into market via global standards is really where my, my passion is these days. Great, thanks very much for that, David, and for ex explaining that. And as you said, there's, there's, there's two distinctive tracks here that we, we may well see with um, as we go towards 6G. Um, any, any of other guests want to contribute on this area about where companies, maybe broaden it out. Joe, let's, let's broaden it out to see where companies can, can contribute to 6G R&D. So I would say that um, since 2015 and and the issues that we had in the industry, well well documented on uh, WRC, um, has been the, the the suppliers now um, under the GSA umbrella, whether it's Spectrum um, or whether it's now standardisation, um, are come together in a group. You know, our, our executive is is the majority of you know the main suppliers in the industry. Um, MediaTek uh, just joined. As an executive member, and so collectively now, you know, we're all going in, pulling in the in the same direction, so that we we want to uh, make sure that there's a a single voice. We have a single technology uh, uh, suggestion, and we support the three GPP technology roadmap, um, and so that we are not at odds against each other. You know, we find competitive ways to um, to, you know to work individually as companies. But then we understand that there's a, a common end goal um, to make sure we have a single technology standard through 3GPP going forward. So I think there's a lot of change has happened, uh, which maybe some of the hyperscalers see in past history. But um, hopefully we won't see that happen um, in the future for 6G. No, th thanks very much, Joe. And, you know, history shows us this, this single approach or the, the focused approach um, benefits us all. Um, it's worked so well in the past. Uh, Narotham, let's come across to you for some uh, comments on this question. Yeah, I would just add that uh, I, I don't know, I won't say specific to hyperscalers, but I, I would emphasize the importance of collaboration uh, in the industry partners. We have seen that at NGMN, uh, both operator member community as well as the industry partners uh, from various sectors participating really helps us formulate the ideas. We have seen similar level of participations in NextG Alliance in the United States. So I think collaboration is going to be key. And uh, getting alignment, as, 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 it, as was stated, is also very important. But I think hyperscalers can come and collaborate 
with the operators, with chipset makers, with infrastructure vendors, and make sure that whatever we are designing, we are designing with the objective of how can we improve the quality of life for our customers, and how and how can we deliver it in a cost-effective fashion. Excellent. Yes, indeed. Uh, and you know, there's so much we can do if, if we work together and uh, work together successfully. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, we ought to go and check in now for one last time with our audience poll for our 5G Evolution Summit. One question, seven answer options, and you can pick whichever ones you feel are the most relevant. And the question we have been asking this week is, which technologies and capabilities are most needed for optimized 5G systems? And you can see the current votes right here on the graphic. And as we keep saying, no, they don't add up to 100%. And that's because you can vote for multiple choices. Now, energy efficiency and cloud native have been so close these past two days, jostling for the top spot. And that looks to be the same, although it does look like cloud native has, has pulled ahead for the first time. Now, if you've yet to vote, please do so now. We're keeping the polls open until the end of today. So you have a few hours to cast your vote. We still have another, what's that, about 20 minutes or so remaining of the programme, so there's still plenty of time for more of your questions. So please keep sending them in. Meanwhile, uh, let's cross over and see how Ray's getting on. <laughs> yes, I'm back, Guy. Um, and uh, back in time to see the, the latest poll results and see how they've, uh, they've shifted and changed uh, in the past 24 hours. Um, so uh, as yesterday, uh, cloud native functionality is up there and is getting the, the most results. In fact, half the people who have voted have uh, changed, uh, selected it rather. Um, but I wonder if any of our guests today have any uh, comments on these poll results. For example, AI and ML uh, functionality talked about an awful lot in terms of delivering the kind of uh, real time and automated capabilities that 5G networks need, but only voted for by 40%. So four out of 10 people who have voted have identified this as absolutely key for optimized 5G. So uh, any comments at all from our panelists here today on these poll results? Any big surprises in those results? Uh, any shocks? Anything you, you, you think should have been uh, should be getting more uh, results, uh, more votes from our from our uh, readers and from our viewers. Anybody want to start off with any comments at all? Uh, David, yes, we'll come to you. I'll go, I'll go first and open it up. Um, I think all of the the options are very valid options. That that's probably the problem. Um, we know that we need to consume less energy, um, but is it a priority for today's five G advance? I would say technology research and standardization. When it comes out to products and deployment, that's another question. But the things we need to clarify in the standardization, certainly um, it probably isn't energy, energy efficiency today, number one. Some areas where we're seeing comp, uh, feedback from network deployments is how to, how to manage uh, virtual slices, how to manage private networks, how to do end-to-end -end quality assurance. I mean, standards are in place, but I think we're seeing, in 3GBP it works wonderfully. We define systems um, and then we get feedback from, from industry as they deploy them. So we get change requests coming in. We can see where the greatest volume of change requests are and we can see that's often on the radio side. So getting the radio to work. Millimeter wave technology is, is a fantastic technology, but getting it deployed in the network is really complicated. And we're seeing that by sort of how many millimeter wave applications are being deployed in, in real time. And already we're talking about terahertz. So I think from a standards point of view, we need to focus on getting it working. So getting the feedback from people deploying the networks in the field and, and then correcting those in the specifications to allow the products to be 100% ready to go to, to market when the functionality needs to be deployed. Saying that, um, if I had to pick one, I think the whole issue of the distributed edge um, extreme edge, cloud, that really is something where it, it's complicated. And you will throw in AI and ML to the equation as well, because it's basically everywhere. So I think probably clarity is required on how we're going to manage the cloud, how we're going to do uh, virtual um, slicing management, how we're going to have handover of, of da data between public and private clouds. It's, it's really complicated. So if I were to pick one, I would say, let's focus on that. But all of them are really, really relevant. 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, all all relevant indeed, but kind of interesting as well to see that uh, there's something I there's so much talk and focus these days about uh, uh, metaverse experience, uh, extended reality applications, and what impact that might have on networks. And yet, uh, less than 20% uh, of the voters have highlighted um, support for those kind of applications as key to uh, getting uh, the, the most optimized 5G network. Um, so, uh, Joe, uh, any thoughts from you on our poll results tool? Yes, although it's not, um, you know, in the, in the top couple there, I think the IoT side of the, the business is, is starting to really take off. Um, and especially as David mentioned, you know, the private mobile networks, um, that's grown so much now um, and we, uh, that we've had to take that, uh, make it its own database um, so that people can search and look for that. And we'll be spending more time on, on focusing on that area. I think there's close to a, a thousand uh, 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 private mobile networks that we are, we are tracking. Um, and, and we're working quite close now uh, with the cooperation with the 5G ACIA uh, from the industrial side. And so they're very keen on how do they understand private mobile networks, uh, IoT, their deployments. So I think that we're going to see a growth in that segment um, and far more interest in the IoT side of 5G um, over the next two or three years. Yeah, absolutely, undoubtedly. And this, this is obviously cropping up a, an awful lot more, especially as enterprise services and applications that have long been seen as the, the, the pot of gold at the end of the 5G rainbow. It's starting to come into view. Um, so absolutely, yeah. And, that, and that's that that's doing pretty well in the poll. And of course, that poll is still open and people can still go and vote and uh, have an impact on the end results of that poll as well. Um, so if there are no further comments, uh, Guy, maybe we should move back now to our audience questions. Yep. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, now we've got another question in here that's first the 6G and it really kind of builds on, on what we just heard um, over the past few minutes there. The question is, um, I hear a lot about the societal benefits of 6G, but isn't the real requirement for 6G that it is designed from the outset to support industrial use cases, creating a purpose-built fabric for business needs? Uh, interesting. Um, you know, Narotham, you've done a lot of work with NGMN already on, on looking ahead at use cases. And I think with 5G, we try to get 5G positioned as the as the, as the as the optimal solution for business and enterprises, but do we need to do more work with uh, with six G from the outset, from a design phase, to to make it um, a better fit for some of the the new industrial applications we may see? Yeah, so, so guy, I mean, you mentioned also about the societal goals, and that has been one of our key uh, drivers for six G as well, because network infrastructure is very essential to to the society and it's critical so whatever we do and however we evolve the technology impacts uh, the lives of our uh, people so i think that always has to be kept in mind along with the uh, uh, other use uh, other drivers uh, that go with it so in terms of uh, further enhanced communication human communication uh, I, the way we are thinking about it is like we have classified the use cases into four buckets. Uh, one being enhanced human communication. Underneath that, we think the use cases such as XR immersive or holographic telepresence communication uh, can fall into that. The other one is enhanced machine communication. Uh, underneath that, it could be robot, robot network fabric and interacting cobots. And then the third one was enabling services. To give you an example here, this is where here we, we believe smart industry and digital healthcare uh, can fit in. And then the finally, the fourth one was network evolution, which is where we believe the trusted native AI comes into play and energy efficiency comes into play and coverage expansion. So that's how we've been thinking in the NGMN and that's how we have classified the use cases into the four broad categories. Excellent. Thank you, Narothma. Good to hear that. Uh, nice and clear there. Um, 
unless anybody wants to come in directly on this one, that we have had a little quick follow-up question whilst Narothan's been talking there. And, and, and David, it's kind of directed towards you about the, the enterprise side. Um, are you seeing enterprises getting involved in research and development for 6G at this stage? Yeah, already in 5G, uh, in 3GBP, there's a very good uh, interaction with verticals or other industries with the MRPs, uh, market representation partners. So the important thing, as I said earlier, is that we need to talk to the communities, the industrial, the automotive, the broadcasters, uh, and all the different communities. Um, in the projects, I'm mainly seeing uh, the typical telecoms companies, um, universities, operators, but there are other projects. So I'm looking at SNSJU, which is very ICT centric, but there are consortia looking at um, digital corridors going between between countries in the UK for having connected vehicles and ITS systems. These include all of the big players from, from Bosch to, to Volkswagen, Audi and, and others. So as soon as you move into a more, let's say, vertical centric, is that a word, um, use case, then you'll see the actors involved. If you're looking at more the generic, so rim, reflective intelligence surfaces or or terahertz modeling, you're going to get the, the experts in the field there. So generally, depending on the research funding system you look at, if you're looking at auto automotive, if you're looking at connected ports, um, there you're going to find all of the actors related to a connected port maritime activity. So yes, they are involved, but in slightly different places. Well, that's interesting. Good to hear. Thank, thank you very much um, for that insight there, David. Um, well, in that case, I think we should move on because we've probably got time for squeezing a couple more questions before we go, actually. But uh, Ray, I'll hand back over to you. OK, thanks, Guy. Um, so this next question is from somebody in the industry that uh, is feeling that, that 5G maybe hasn't reached its full potential just yet. And the question is that there is clear disappointment in the 5G offerings amongst 5G aficionados. Uh, there are also concerns that telcos are not going to make money with 5G. Consequently, everyone is waiting for 5G advance as the answer or the solution to these concerns. Um, so what should be expected uh, with respect to uh, the, the telcos being able to, to make money from 5G? Is 5G advance going to uh, open up uh, the floodgates and, and start delivering uh, new incremental revenues for the telcos. So uh, does anybody want to, to come in and, and, and answer that? A, a, a slightly, um, uh, maybe cynical is a bit too harsh a word, but uh, uh, Narotham, uh, do, you want, do, you, do you want to come in on this one? Sure, I can definitely start off and uh, I'll ask my colleagues to chime in as well. So I think it is so when we think of the use cases for 5G, it is true that we are still not, we haven't seen a lot of use cases matured yet, but we do have a very promising use case that we believe uh, it, it, it holds a lot of value today and that's fixed wireless access. Fixed wireless access is here today, it's real. And uh, we have done a lot of work with fixed wireless access. Today we offer products uh, using low band as well as with, even with millimeter wave. We have done a lot of good work with our industry partners, Qualcomm, Nokia, Ericsson, and Insego on extending the range of millimeter wave and covering more households so that we can ultimately close the digital divide in rural America. So I think fixed wireless access is a, is a use case that is there today and that gives us an opportunity uh, to bridge the digital divide. The other use cases such as XR, AR, and uh, many others, I think I'm still very hopeful. I think it's a matter of timing. Uh, they are not mature today, but I think with the capabilities that 5G and 5G Advance brings, these use cases will mature over time. But if you ask me today, they have, they're, they're still in very nascent stages of development. And hopefully in two, three years from now, we'll see more use cases evolving. Yeah, thanks, Narotham. And uh, you know, I wonder if it, a little bit the the industry has uh, has hampered itself a little bit with by being too uh, hyperbolic about five uh, G early on and giving great expectations about what it might deliver 
uh, very early on because I mean we're at the big, still at the beginning of what is looks likely to be a very long 5G uh, cycle for the whole industry. Um, uh, Joe, did you want to come in on this? I mean, do you think it's fair to say that you know 5G is not delivering on on on, on what is uh, promised that we need further upgrades that 5G advance is needed before anybody can make any money? So um, hot of the press. Um, so there'll be a new um, report on the GSA website um, uh, by tomorrow. Uh, but the latest figures um, that I have is that they now have 228 operators in 92 countries have launched um, 5G commercially. And we've got 505 operators in 155 countries that are actually investing in 5G. And of those, 111 are doing 5G standalone. So to say that 5G isn't success or is not being deployed, uh, I think is a bit of a misnomer. Um, it is being deployed um, and we're seeing it being deployed in new spectrum uh, that's been assigned over the past uh, few years. So I think we've got a lot of good access working. Um, and as uh, mentioned, you know, fixed wireless access as a use case, you know, we're, we're tracking 432 LTE uh, networks and 141 5G fixed wireless access networks. So, you know, 5G is delivering and it will continue to deliver over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt that 5G is very much here. Lots of in, investments. Uh, I think may, maybe the, the, the question was a little bit more focused on, you know, are, are the operators uh, a, able to monetize uh, these investments. But uh, again, it is uh, still quite um, early on in the game as well. Uh, but that sounds like a, a great report uh, you've got there, Joe. Um, so be looking for that tomorrow morning. Great numbers, great stats. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, David, you wanted to come in here as well. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add, I mean, what has been said is absolutely correct, but I just wanted to, to add, you, you're not going to jump straight from 4G to 5G advanced. You need, operators need to be rolling out 5G, early 5G, non-standalone and standalone 5G to actually, well, to get it known to the public, first of all, to get it accepted by the public, to get it desired by the public also. And then to, to really, you know, I'm not saying you, you test it, test to see what works and what doesn't work, but you need to have a very strong 5G being rolled out, being improved as we move along. Inside a generation, you have releases in 3GBP from release 15 all the way up to release 18 now. And each each release improves the, the foundational specification, which improves the technology which is being in, uh, deployed and then upgraded via software. So you have to evolve. You, ca you cannot jump from late 4G to 5G advanced. You can't hop to 6G. And these networks, 4G still turned on, well, 2G still turned on, which isn't very good for energy efficiency. But you, you, you need to be able to evolve smoothly between the releases which are inside the generations. And I think we're hearing two, 140, 200 networks deployed around the world. All of those people are using vendor equipment. Operators are getting experience as they roll out. They're seeing where the pain points are. And all of this is coming back into the specifications to be corrected, to allow, then allow the equipment to be absolutely perfect. And that equipment can be upgraded over the air as well. So I think getting ready, when we talk about money, you know, um, that, that's another issue. I'm sure money is being made with early 5G. Many of the advanced use cases, uh, I saw a demo uh, recently on, on connected cars, 5G Crocro was the, was the project, and these are very advanced uses of 5G. So I think if we get FWA right, if we get the market to accept 5G, if we get the users to desire 5G, both consumer and business, we're on the right track. So yes, I'm sure 5G early is a good thing. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so positive messages there from uh, our panel. Uh, money can be made and not just by uh, the, the vendors who are uh, able to sell their technology to the operators. Um, so Guy, have we got time for, for, for one more audience question today? Yes, Ray, I think we do. We're squeezing one more question here um, because we, we do get a lot of questions on our summits from the smaller operators. And, and this question really goes to that. The question is, 
Will smaller operators be able to prepare and take advantage of 6G? The resources needed just for 5G are going to take all their time and money. Will 6G risk shrinking the market because only the major operators will be able to afford to prepare for it and develop for it? So interesting point there, as, you know, as we go up the generations, is it getting more and more expensive in terms of not just money, but resources and uh, you know manpower to, to support and, uh, and, and get involved and shape the next generation of, of mobile. Uh, Nerotham, at NGMN, you know, you, you're an operator-led association. You, you, you've got a lot of peers in that group. Uh, you know, you've been putting together your, your, your 6G use case uh, papers. Um, do, do you think there's a risk that, that 6G might alienate or exclude some of the smaller operators? Or is that always a problem we have with, with the process of, of mobile? Yeah, so my view is that it, it doesn't because with NEG, uh, the... Uh, the factors remain the same, right? I mean, uh, it may be it may be different uh, for different operators, but I don't believe it's it excludes anybody. Uh, well, uh, having said that, I would say that we should not rush as an industry uh, to 6G. I think we are building five. We have just rolling out 5G networks, as it was mentioned before, and we are on a good trajectory. Uh, we need to make sure that the 5G advanced capabilities come in and then maybe keep 6G to the 2030 timeline. Uh, and, and as I said before, one key element of that is as we develop 6G, we got to keep in mind how we can improve spectral efficiency, how I can provide more bits per hertz uh, in a cost-effective manner. TCO needs to be uh, a key driver from day one. Uh, energy efficiency. So I think all those factors need to happen that will also help uh, many operators, large and small, uh, in rolling out the 6G when, it, when it's ready. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for those comments. And, um, you know, Joe, something that Rotham picked up on there was the spectral efficiency. And, you know, you talk a lot in the GSA about the need for, for spectrum and, and releasing sufficient spectrum in the right bands. Um, it, it's, is this going to be a, a way of ensuring that uh, 6G is a, a democratic environment for, for all operators? Well, I think if you look within the, the activity within the, uh, the GSA spectrum group, you know, we're, we're identifying new areas of spectrum um, in the mid band, in the high band. Um, but as Ray mentioned earlier as well, uh, in, in the terahertz band. Um, so, you know, there is, there's new spectrum that's becoming available. Uh, we need to understand how, you know, terahertz spectrum can fit into the, um, the scheme of things and, and deployment schedules. So I think the yeah, spectrum is going to be a key area. And uh, it's always a far, uh, hard fought uh, battle to, uh, to release spectrum and to get agreement. But in the end, I think that we can see the benefits of, of the different spectrum, um, whether it's within, you know, the mid band uh, expanding into new areas uh, or bringing in new higher spectrum. Yeah, indeed, difficult battle indeed. Thank you, Joe. Uh, David, uh, I can't go without a final comment from yourself. Um, you know, how do we ensure that 6G doesn't exclude a lot of the players in the industry, a lot of the smaller operators? How, how do we keep everybody in, involved and engaged? It's a difficult question, but I think we already have part of the answer in 5G. We've seen in the past five to seven years how many new operators, greenfield operators, alternative operators, and vendors as well also, uh, and different approaches if you look at what's happening in the open community as well. Um, so in the past five years, we've already seen this inclusivity, this um, expanding of the ecosystem. Um, we also have many different uh, people running um, private 5G networks, virtual private networks. Um, and so these are expanding the number of players already playing in 5G. I don't think 6G will exclude anybody. Um, the contrary is planned is that it will be more inclusive. It will, it will be the, sounds a bit like Tolkien, but it will be the network to help it, uh, connect all networks. It will help connect all the industries and have a free flow, flow of data between objects, people, and, and other things. So I think we need to look at expanding the community, expanding the network, expanding the number of operators, but in an ordered manner. I mean, it's going to be very complicated to manage. Manage the network, manage the spectrum, regulate 
uh, the, the various operators as well. Will a private network have to provide emergency services if it's covering a university campus or something like that? So I think there's a lot of open questions, but we do have time. I hopefully won't see any 6G before 2030. I think we have lots of time on our hands with 5G. And again, it can be a learning experience. We can find out exactly what needs to be done in 2030. And I hope industry will not push to have an early drop of 6G, as we saw in 5G. I've heard many operators saying, let's get 6G right. Let's get good quality specifications on time when we need them. And let's not rush at this too early. I think that's what a lot of us want to hear, David. Encouraging words to um, end this summit. Yeah, thanks very much for saying that. Uh, here, here. Uh, well, we are out of time now. Um, thank you so much to all of our guests for joining us for this live program. And of course, to our audience for sending in those excellent questions. Yeah, what a great couple of days we've had, Guy. Uh, fantastic insights into key areas of 5G services and network developments, uh, from 5G standalone to fixed wireless access to beyond 5G. Uh, and we're really still only at the beginning of this all. So I'm looking forward to our next summit already. Oh, yes, me too. And if you have topics you want covered in future summits, then please do get in touch with us and let us know. And if you missed any of the earlier programmes over the past two days, they will all be available to watch on demand from tomorrow. Ray and I will return in just two weeks' time with the Network Automation Summit, where we'll be discussing, amongst other things, the evolution of orchestration and the promise of network as a service. Until then, thank you so much for watching and goodbye.